Hello, hello, hello. Jump on the chat if you are here. Um, my name's Nish and I'm one of the, uh, the teachers here at Aim High. And this is an Aim High Live, a philosophy Aim High Live. And uh, the big question we're going to explore today is, do we live in a simulation? Is everything you know and love just a bunch of ones and zeros, uh, a bunch of code uh, in someone's computer somewhere in the future? Uh, is it real? Is there a difference between those two things? How do you know if other people have minds like your mind? Are they conscious or not? Uh, or are they just um, sim simulants in a video game? Look, this is what we're going to explore today. I'm very excited to do so. Um, oh, yes, look at all these people saying morning. Pumpkin Master, M. Loden, Ms. 91, New Zealand Catherine. I love that you specify where in the world you're from, New Zealand Catherine, so I can imagine what your comments sound like. So it's like, oh, hey, Nish. Am I right? Am I right? All right, let's go through uh, this little vortex of terror on our way to this screen. Do we live in a simulation? All right, now while we are while we're um, getting things kicked off, I would love to hear from you if you can guess all six of these images and where in the history of popular culture they are from. Bonus points if you get all six, um, five gold stars. Um, but yeah, if you're just tuning in, this is an Aim High Live, please ask questions as we go. This is the philosophy one. And we're looking at this question right there on the screen. Do we live in a simulation? Um, now, have I got guesses for things on here? I'm going to give you a clue. This first one, Matrix. Ooh, Pumpkin Master's coming in with Rick and Morty. That is correct. Rick. Oh my gosh, my handwriting is terrible. I can't blame the tech, this is just my handwriting. Rick and Morty, any other guesses out there? Okay, we've got Black Mirror, we've got Westworld. Oh, you guys just snap these up very quick. All right, I'm not, I'm not gonna type them out, that is correct. Matrix, it's Neo, our mate, Rick, Morty. This is uh, the Hang the DJ episode of Black Mirror. Uh, this is indeed the Hitchhiker's Guide to Galaxy, Truman Show, and Westworld. Now, some of these are more obvious than others, are literally about simulations. This is a great episode of Rick and Morty, if you haven't seen it already, about simulation within a simulation. It's very good. Um, Hang the DJ is an episode of Black Mirror about Sorry, this is a spoiler. I mean, this one's been out on Netflix for a while, so you've had your time. Um, episode where two people realize they're in, they're in a dating simulation. Um, now, Westworld, this is uh, slightly different, sort of about a computer simulation, but it is this question about other minds and how do we know if they're real? The shark has got to the galaxy. Obviously, all of Earth is a simulation, trying to answer the question of the meaning of life, like a planetary computer, which will come up later. And finally here, The Truman Show. This is a bit of an old school classic. Um, but it, um, it's not, again, not about a computer simulation, but it is this question of um, how, do we do, how do we know that the life we're leading is a real life filled with meaning um, and not a, a fake life filled with actors, which I'm sure we've all thought about at some point in time because we're all huge narcissists. So um, this is our, our way into this question of do we live in a simulation for those who are just joining, which is our big question today. Um, and I would love to hear from you what percentage chance that you have um, in your mind of what are the chance that we live in a simulation at the moment? Um, just chuck those percentage guesses on the screen. Is it, you know, 50 50 either way? Is it definitely, we definitely live in a simulation, you're like 99.9% .9 sure, or is it like 1%, 0%? There's no chance. You just, you know, you're real, you know, you live in a real world. Um, Oh, Mia's 91, uh, of course, of course you do. Of course you think it's a 100% chance. Um, M. Loden, we've got 99.9, .9, not 99.9 .9 repeater, but a sp specific version of 99.9999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999
Um, can anyone tell me what this is an image of there in the center of the screen? If you know what, holla. Oh yeah, that is right. Oh, Pong, <laughs> thank you, Am I Live? Aka okay, at this point, Matthew Schumann for the correct spelling of Pong. This is indeed Pong, and I'll tell you why that's on screen in a second. But um, today we're gonna look at um, a particular philosophical theory, a philosophical argument um, for the ch arguing about the chances that we live in a simulation. And people have kind of used and abused this argument quite a lot. It's become quite popular um, to talk about in like on YouTube essays, video essays in the last kind of three or four years, particularly since Elon Musk brought it up. And so people use this to argue that there's anywhere between a 33.3, well, that's supposed to be a three. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've seen my own handwriting. Okay, 33.3% chance anywhere between there to what 99.9 .9 repeater percent chance that we live in a simulation. I mean, that's, I mean, I, I don't know. Um, hey, Viscount Von James, firstly, love your name. I've always wanted to meet uh, Viscount, now I have. Um, but no, it's all right if you have no idea. I mean, that's what it's all about. We're just exploring this together, uh, figuring it out. And I think to be fair, most of us probably say we should have no idea because uh, we don't, except unless your name is Nick Bostrom, who came up with the theory we're looking today. This is called the Bostrom Simulation Theory. So he thinks it's about 33.3% chance. Other people have gone all the way up to 99.9%. Now, the reason that Pong is on your screen at the moment is because people who are interested in this kind of thing start with something like Pong, which I think, I should know this, I think was invented in like 1986, like not that long ago. And this was like the height of video game in fact, the first video game ever invented, obviously it's like, you know, playing table tennis or not table tennis because it does bounce off the side. But, you know, if you haven't seen it before, you have these two little paddles going up and down and you've got this little ball bouncing around the screen. You've just got to try and get it past um, your opponent to get the score points, right? That's how sophisticated video games were a few decades ago. And already, you know, we're playing uh, games on our computers and our Xbox and our Playstations and our Switches, etc., which are like hyper-realistic graphics with really intelligent, um, kind of simulated intel uh, really uh, incredibly simulated intelligence in like you know the enemy uh, AI etc and so the argument goes something like this you know if we just project forward at this kind of rate of incredible growth in just video games um, th there should be a chance at some point in the future there are going to be kind of human civilizations or even post-human civilizations or alien civilizations at some point come up with technology um, that that creates uh, an experience which is just so much like reality uh, that we actually can't tell the difference. So let me um, let me walk you through uh, this argument. It's actually deceptively simple, and there's only three parts to it. So let's look at the first part, and, and also as a little a preamble, the way this argument is set up is a bit different to other arguments. Um, it just kind of says there are three options for the future. And these are the only three options uh, that are possible. So keep that in mind as we go through. So this is option one uh, for the future, is the kind of doomsday option. So this says that um, uh, in the course of history, as technology continues to evolve and computing processing power evolves and we continue to master technology, um, before we get to the stage where we can create these hyper-realistic simulations and put uh, upload consciousnesses into them, or create consciousnesses in them, um, civilization destroys itself. So this is true for you know our timeline or any civilization uh, that is kind of has our current level of sophistication and uh, our computing processing power, etc. This is this argument is just that before we can ever simulate something like a human experience, we destroy ourselves. So maybe this is. Uh, through nuclear war, or we unload, unleash like nanobots in the universe, or there's like, you know, a hyper powerful uh, biological virus that wipes out all of life, whatever. Um, so this is, uh, this is a good uh, intervention from M. Loden, by the way. What's the difference between 100% and 99.9% repeated? Look, full disclosure, I'm not a mathematician. Um, but 99.9% repeated is used to it, it's practically 100%. I mean, in mathematical reality, it is 100%. There's some mathematics I remember in high school. I forgot now. Um, but the idea is that it's like, it's let's just say it's practically 100%, but you can't say 100% because that's like, you can't have that level of assuredness. Um, 
Also, jump in the chat. Let me know how you think the world would end in scenario one. What is the most likely way that we will destroy ourselves before we can create a simulated reality? Chuck that in the chat. I want to hear, um, I want to hear your thoughts, your your future predictions. You guys are very creative. I'm sure you had some interesting imagine imagination projections of how the world will end. Um, so, but that's option one. So option one, doomsday scenario. Before you can ever create um, a simulation, uh, you wipe yourself out. Then there's option two. Let's say that a society like ours continues to progress technologically and solve some of the problems that stop a doomsday scenario happening. By the time we get to the point where we can create simulated realities that are indistinguishable from a kind of physical reality like ours, um, uh, we, once we've got to that point, we no longer have any reason to create a simula simulated reality. So there's lots of reasons why option two might happen. Um, maybe by the time, you know, uh, we reach this kind of stage, we're just such elevated beings. We don't want to look into, uh, simulate a past. There'd be no reason to, we find no pleasure in it. We could just kind of stimulate the pleasure senses in our brains, or we just don't even think about humans anymore in the same way that, you know, we don't think about, um, homo erectus or like, I mean, some of us do, but like, let's say that there, there's, there's no reason why you would. Uh, use the computing, like the crazy computing process, processing power you would need to create a simulated reality. There's no incentive to actually do that um, because it would be so high and you've got other things that you're getting up to. Um, so that's option two, that there's no, uh, there's no incentive to create a simulated reality. And here comes option three. This is, this is going to feel like a little bit of a intellectual, emotional whiplash. And this is, he says, Nick Bostrom says, this is the only other option is that we are living in a simulation. I don't freak out. This feels, feels a bit, a bit weird. You were kind of with, with Nick Bostrom so far. You were like, yeah, okay. Option one, we all wipe ourselves out before we can simulate reality. Get that. Option two, maybe we can simulate reality at some point, but by that point we have no reason to. Okay. Get that. And then option three is the only other option. And Nick Bostrom says, yes. And this is why he says, yes. Um, Nick Bostrom says that, um, if there are uh, civilizations at some point in the, in the future or the past or however you want to think about timelines or aliens or whatever, but if there are civilizations that have the technological capability to simulate realities, um, all it would take would be for them to run, uh, you know, a, a, you know, more, all it would take for them to run two uh, simulations and then our chances of being in the kind of base reality, the real reality, go down to one in three, because we're either in that base reality or in one of those two simulations. And then if you just keep going, you know, Bostrom says, you know, if they have the computing processing power, um, they could create hundreds of simulations and run them in parallel. And just imagine all of these different simulations are out there, they're like a dartboard and every single one of them. Um, and only one of them is the real world and all the others are simulated worlds. If you just close your eyes and throw a dart at the dartboard, the chances of you hitting base reality and that being where you live um, is so much less likely than just hitting one of these other simulations. And this is, this is where um, some people like Elon Musk have gone a bit nuts with this and gone, it's actually one in a billion, billion chances that we live in the real reality. It's much more likely that we live in this simulation. They're thinking about this little argument there. Um, now I'm, I just want to circle back to some of your doomsday predictions because I just love this. I get a lot out of it. Uh, we've got climate change or AI, very wise. World War Three, sadly, yes, this could wipe us out. Um, ecosystem collapse. Okay, these are very serious, and I respect the hell out of that. But I was hoping for more like zombie apocalypses or. Um, you know, one superhuman uh, gains like 10 arms, creates super, you know, superhuman armies, etc. If you have more of those, let me know. But otherwise, hey, no pressure. You guys are realists. You guys are futurists. You guys are the politicians of the future. This is what kind of thinking we need. All right. So I'm going to put all of these on the screen again. This next screen, I apologize in advance. It's a very messy screen. It's pretty ugly. It's got a lot of text on it. But this is it. This is the whole thing. So there are only three options. No civilization reaches uh, the technological power to create a simulation. Option one, option two, uh, a civilization uh, or many civilizations reach that point, um, but all of them choose not to create simulate simulations. That's option two. And then the final only option Nick Rostrom says we have is that we live in a simulation. 
Okay, <laughs> avalanche of cows. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> there we go. Um, Mm, what scares me is if we're living in a simulation, pumpkin master, he's a master of pumpkins, he's a master of philosophy, because there's a lot, a lot of responsibility. And this, I mean, this is the crazy thing, right? So in, in some of the people who talk about this, they like to imagine that it might just not just be like a bunch of, um, you know, very responsible scientists creating these simulations, it, like the technological capability could be so large in the same way that, you know, um, you know, there's more processing power in like our smartphones than uh, in the Apollo 11 that took you know, humankind to the moon in 1969. In the same way, technological capability could, could progress so that even like, you know, 15 year old punks in their mother's basement have access to the kind of computing processor that could just like run simulations um, all the time. And some 16 year old or 15 year old might be like, hey, you know, it'd be crazy. It's like back in the year um, 2016, a celebrity uh, reality, reality TV star became the president of the United States. What would have happened to our ancestors if that happened? And then it just, they've just run the simulation and we're just like simulated consciousnesses experiencing this right now. And our memories are fake, um, from the rest of our life and life just started in 2016. And they're just like trying to see what happens. Like that could be one of the options. Um, all right. Now, now this is, this is the little cool juncture in today's live where we're not just going to talk about philosophy. I'm now going to invite all of you to actually do some philosophy. This is the great thing about um, philosophy. You can do it anywhere, anytime. You can do it in your home, in lockdown, here on at Aim High Live. And this is how we're going to do it. I'm going to give you a full minute, maybe 30 seconds to a minute. We'll see how, how, how long this takes. And um, I just want you to, all right, so I've, I've created a cheeky, this is, okay, this might be confusing. What's all this stuff down here? So I want you, so this is, this is the simulation, Nick Bostrom's simulation theory, the whole thing. All right, that's a terrible circle, undo. Um, those are the three options. That's the whole argument. What I want you to do for a minute is come up with any objections that you have to how this argument holds together. So I'll give you some clues of how you might go about doing this because I know this is quite intimidating. So um, you might come up with some other options that you haven't thought about. Um, you might um, you might try and unpick some of the assumptions on which this whole thing is based, and that's what some of this stuff is about. So I've given you some clues at the bottom of ways that you might um, attack this. You want to attack one of these three, uh, or come up with a different alternative hypothesis he's not thought about. Anyway, I'm going to give you a minute. Um, it, it doesn't have to be this like knockdown argument. I just want to hear any objections that you have to the simulation theory, uh, ways you think. Uh, it could be attacked or counter arguments you could have, or just like how it makes you feel, whatever responses you give. I'm going to give you one minute to do that. And don't worry, I'm going to provide you with some thinking music. It's going to be me uh, humming the tune to Daybreak, a great, um, a great tune, great soulful tune for you. But anyway, as I said, there's some clues down here. I've given you four different ways that you might attack this thing or attack some of the assumptions on which it's built. Um, anyway, enough chatting from me. A bit more um, chat from you. I'll give you a minute while I hum daybreak and do some drawings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, great humming. This is what I live for. Um, <laughs> sorry, I missed some great doomsday predictions about superpowers. Aliens pluck us out of the world, in the universe, and compress us. Um, okay, okay. Down to some of your feedback, and again, keep them coming through, and they don't have to be counter arguments. Uh, they could just be feelings that you have, just like things that make you feel a bit icky about this, because underneath some of those, there might be some interesting counter arguments. Um, all right, so this is M. Lowedion. M. Lowedion. Uh, option three has the statistics on its side as opposed to option one. Uh, that's interesting, yes, because it's just like, because uh, if civilizations had the power to simulate um, conscious experiences for, for in simulated worlds. There could be billions and billions of them. Um, uh, great humming. Yes, great. Uh, Me and one, an argument against the simulation could be like what Pumpkin Master said about superpowers. Why isn't it cooler? Interesting. I mean, I assume someone like Matthew Shipman would counter with being like, this universe is really cool. You've just got to realize. Um, and maybe our universe is cooler than base reality. But I mean, that, I don't know how they would do that because they'd have simulation power. But um, no, that's interesting. So it's like, this is the kind of kind of argument of like, 
uh, if this were a simulation, we might expect it to behave differently than it does kind of argument. And then you might give reasons for that. Like we might expect it to be cooler, or we might expect it to be like fairer and have less suffering in it, something like that. What else have we got in there? Uh, are the people running the simulation people like us? Are they also in the simulation? That's a great question, Mia's 91. And this is another interesting point. The one, one way that people have kind of argued uh, this whole thing is um, that if, let's say it's like a Russian doll situation and there's like real, base reality, what you, what you want to call it, simulation one, then they simulate another simulation, blah, 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 and it goes on forever. Um, actually, you don't need to worry about all those billions of simulations in between. Then now it becomes a 50-50 shot. Are we either the first reality or the last reality that hasn't figured out how to simulate yet? That's one way of thinking about it. But then there's kind of arguments against that as well. Anyway, okay. Um, this Campbell and James, he's back. Uh, is it even possible to manufacture consciousness? Will it ever be? And if these future us's, us, 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 can create consciousness, would they be able to create our consciousness as opposed to theirs? Oh, this Count Von James, he's coming in with the, with the goods. So that's, that's why I had this little human brain there. Um, maybe we should, now is a good time to move over here to objections. Um, so yes, this is a good one. I'll, I'll bounce off you. So it's like this, I don't know why I'm even, trying to use my handwriting. Okay. Um, is something like uh, assumes human consciousness is replicable. Um, okay, very small font, but you guys get the idea. So that is a huge assumption in all three scenarios, particularly obviously three, um, but even two is the idea that um, the kind of thing that human consciousness is a emergent property of like, the synapses in our brains firing off um, uh, is the idea that you know you can just take it from this carbon-based life and you can just like recreate it uh, and simulate it electronically in ones and zeros or whatever the coding language is, um, and that's a huge that's a huge assumption of all of this. Um, now, human consciousness is like you know philosophy of mind, neuroscience. You know, there are so many different ways into these huge questions, and we just know so little about what consciousness is. Uh, it's a huge mystery to us how conscious, like the experience, not just of uh, brain neurons firing, but like the experience of like seeing red and like experiencing redness and like what that is as opposed to like knowing about red. And like, you know, there's all these questions that we, um, that are kind of fluffed over by this argument. So that's, that's a great kind of argument. I'm coming back to the chat. Um, what else have we got in here? Could a simulated world Yep, sorry, sorry. Yes, simulated world developed capable of running simulation. Yes, simulation, simulation, Russian old situation, which does give strength to three. Um, oh, M. Loden, Moore's law isn't necessarily a problem with quantum computing. Okay, okay, no, that's, that's true. So you've given a counter argument to a counter argument, M. Loden, because one argument would be something like, uh, I'm coming to kind of try and handwrite again. Let's see how that goes. Oh, no, no, the app knows that I need to type. Um, so it would be something like tech progress, uh, I don't want to say infinite, that's such a crazy word. Tech progress keeps going. Look, there's a better way to phrase it than, than this. Um, 24, the perfect size. Come on, don't let me down. All right, anyway, tech progress keeps going. Um, is, oh, I'm sorry guys, my phone is, freaking out a bit got this thing with my iphone 6 which came up this week called uh it's like touch disease anyway it's made me very sad but my phone's back it's back in action okay um so one kind of argument would be something like tech progress just keeps going is another huge assumption of this thing um you know and you know we know this if you know Moore's law, like, was it the technological capability of computing versus the power doubles every two years and the, you know, all these arguments about whether we can keep projecting that forward and then this quantum computing, as Mem Loden said, as a possible counter argument to this argument. But it, it is important just to name this. The idea that like, another huge assumption is that technological progress can achieve, particularly computing, pr computer processing power, just keep going and going like it has and there won't be like a lid to it. You know, maybe, you know, there's like, all these questions about how we could harness dark matter for computers or, you know, this incredible compression of quantum computing, blah, blah, blah. I don't really know about stuff, but anyway, important to name 
one assumption is technological progress keeps going. And then you can have, you have to have heaps, heaps of arguments about that before you can actually argue about the simulation theory. All right, I'm back in the chat. Um, Viscount Mon James, could religions also provide an argument like simulations are not accepted by a, de a deity or if there is a God, maybe it is the simulator. I mean, a lot of people have, have taken the simulation theory and run with it in kind of religious directions. Like, uh, you know, if it's since it's more likely that we live in simulation or not, or if there's a one in three chance or whatever, uh, you know, out of those three scenarios, let's just say that each of, the, each of them are as likely as other because we can't really predict, um, then we should try and live a life that pleases our simul simulator. Uh, that's a, a direction we could take it, but also religions might have some objection, be like, well, if you believe in this religion, you believe that the human is more than uh, a brain, it's a soul as well, and you can't replicate that, etc. So those, those are ways in. Um, oh, there's so much good stuff here. This is happening. Um, there's so many, oh my gosh, actually, there's just so much goodness here. I'm going to, okay, let's go to Fatima because I haven't heard from her here. Maybe they do have superpowers, but they enjoy watching super creatures. <laughs> Like how we enjoy watching internet. That's really interesting, by the way. So, like, and this comes to actually another great point, um, which let's just call this uh, the question of incentives. So, Fatima has said, uh, proposed a, um, so sorry, with tiny font, there's so much space. The question of incentives, you know, you know maybe these simulators, uh, if you think about scenario two, where they have the power and they choose not to. Or scenario three, where they have the power and they choose to simulate. All, this all rests on these arguments about what are the incentives of these future post-humans or with their humans or aliens or whoever, whoever is simulating us. Um, and the thing is, we have, we have no idea how to know their incentives for their actions. Because even if they're kind of carbon-based life like us or humans from the future, we just can't understand their incentives in the same way we can't, you know, we can get into the headspace of like ancient Egyptians and Greeks, but then you go back beyond that and you can't really understand the, uh, what it's like to be a homo erectus or something. And so it is really hard to, there's all these questions of incentives. And when it comes into probabilities, we can't really answer them. And this also is an, an, another interesting one, which I touched on in the last slide, this question of ethics. If they are anything like us, we have to ask, why they would simulate suffering at such large scales as they have and would there be some kind of potential kind of technological agreement in the future about um about not creating simulations like this because of the immense amount of suffering and then there might be like you know it creates more good than harm or they might think that we're not real because we're code or whatever but anyway basically this leads to a, a final point i'll make before we finish up with the question of why this matters which is what I'll just call on falsifiability. Um, and I'm just really hoping that, for, for, that the font gods, come on, come on. If you're a simulator out there, let me make this bigger. Okay, um, on falsifiability. And this is why I had that little picture of, um, let me go big. This is why I had that picture of Mr. Truman in the bottom right, which is that, the whole thing about this kind of reason, because it's probabilistic, it's not like a deductive argument, you know, like um, all humans are mortal, Nish is a human, therefore Nish is mortal. That's like a deductive, you can't argue back on that. If the premises are true, the conclusion is true. This is a different kind of argument. It's about probabilities. And it's also, you can't prove it wrong. So think about if you, if you, like you, for some reason, started to really believe that you were in the Truman Show, which for those who haven't watched it or heard about it, because it's an ancient movie, um, Basically, you live in this world, but everyone's actors and you're actually a reality star but, uh, and everything you're doing is being filmed and you're the center of the universe of this film set. A anytime you go up to a cop or something and you're like, hey, is this a simulation? And they say, what are you talking about? There's no simulation. Or you're like, look over there and it looks like that person is reading the newspaper, but actually they were just looking at you. And as soon as you looked over, they just kind of looked down. There's always these counter arguments, reasons uh, that you can come up with um, for that, you know, that's exactly how the actors would behave on the set of the Truman show. So I'm still, you know, Truman, I'm still like the reality star. And this kind of whole argument is similar is that whenever you, if you come up with any kind of evidence against a simulation, anyone can be like, well, that's simulated or that like, you know, that's part of the simu simulation. So you can't actually prove it wrong, which just makes it more like a conspiracy theory than anything else. Um, but, that might leave you with a few other questions. Uh, questions like, okay, well, if it's not 
if it's unfalsifiable and it's kind of like a conspiracy theory, why does it matter? Because we don't really care about a lot of other conspiracy theories. Um, or another question, which is like, well, okay, sure, it's not, you can't prove that it's true, but you also can't prove that it's false. So that still might mean that I'm simulated. Like even if it's like a 0.0111% chance or whether it's a 99.9% .9 chance, like I still don't know if I'm real. I still don't know if this table is real. I don't know if Nish is real. I don't know if the other people in this chat are real or if they're all bots. Like I don't actually know if anything is real. And as we close up, I want to leave you with a few thoughts that philosophy can give you to think through this. Um, like, like scientists might think about this for different reasons, right? Like theoretical physicists at Harvard and MIT and other places actually using some of these thought experiments uh, to help them think about physics because they go, okay, well, if this was a simulation, can we think of an experiment or an algorithm or something that would actually prove that we're in a simulation? And that's kind of just a creative way of asking questions differently. But in philosophy, it's different. These existential questions are like, well, where does meaning come from? And uh, how? I, how, how, what do I do with the angst that this would give me? Um, and as we finish up, I want to leave you with, with a few thoughts. And I, I want to get your thoughts on this as we go. So I won't have a chance to read the matters because we are run out of time. But firstly, I want you to imagine this scenario. You're looking at the night sky. You're wondering about life. You're wondering if you're a simulation, if your mom's a simulation. And then all the stars in the sky just shift and move around till they spell out Yes, Mears 91, Pumpkin Master, Viscount Von James, Fatima, Mlodin, you are in a simulation. This is the simulator speaking. And that, they don't say anything else. That's all they say. And then all the stars kind of go back. And for whatever reason, you kind of check yourself. You know you're not dreaming, whatever. I want to ask you, how differently would you live if you knew that was true? And for the sake of this particular thought experiment, I want you to imagine... Um, maybe they write this in the stars as well, the terms and conditions of this simulation is that all, like your consciousness is simulated, but so is everyone else's. Um, so they're, they're experiencing the simulation like you are, your mum is, I am, um, every other person in this chat is. So we're all simul simulated, we're all, you know, ones and zeros in code. I want to ask you how you would live differently if you knew that was true. So I'll, I'll come back to those reflections at the end. But one answer you might have is that you wouldn't live that differently because let's say that other people who are simulated, you care about, who give your life meaning, they're just as real in a particular sense as they were before. Maybe they're not physically real in the, in the way you thought they were, but they're still real within the laptop uh, of this 16 year old doing his um, reality TV star becomes president of the United States simulation. And so if we think about the things that give us meaning, you know, this is a big argument, but if, if meaning comes through the projects that we create and the way we project future and make uh, plans and we create relationships and create love, all that stuff is still kind of real in one sense in the simulation. So that's one way you might think your way through this. Another thing that you might do with all of this reflection on the simulation is think about what it is possible for you to know. Um, so, you know, some of you will know about the famous kind of, I think, therefore I am conclusion of Descartes, but you might not know where that came from. So for Descartes, uh, René Descartes, a French philosopher from the 16th century, I think maybe 17th century, I should know this, one of the most famous philosophers of all time. Essentially, he came to this huge crisis when he was a young man. And he's like, wait, how do I know that anything in my life is real? And he wasn't thinking about computers, but he was thinking about a demon who was tricking him. Um, and in the same way that sometimes, you know, you can dream and, not, and think it's reality. Maybe everything that you even think when you kind of think you know you're awake is kind of the images um, of, a, of a demon tricking you. And so he, he wrestled with this for 12 years. And to be honest, full disclosure, a little personal storytelling, I wrestled with this question for th I think three and a half, maybe four years myself before I came to something that I knew I could believe. And for Descartes, it was this idea where I think, therefore I am. And what that meant for him was that I think even so, even if all of this stuff is fake, the stuff coming in in my in my senses and my senses are fake, I exist on some plane of existence somewhere. I exist, and maybe I'm a brain and like a vat or like in the matrix or something. But somewhere I exist. The individual having these conscious experiences exists, and so you know that's one example of what you can do with these questions, um, and what that is getting down to is basically this question of. Um, what are some kind of 
what we would call axiomatic beliefs or kind of starting assumptions. And we all have them, right? So we all have these kind of, this is turtle all, all the way down, which I've just put too much in this in my life. I haven't learned from my last in my lives. I've tried to put too much in, but essentially the idea is that every belief and thought you have might rest on some other belief and thought. And it all goes down until there are some of these like, just like turtles hanging in space. Uh, these like fundamental beliefs hanging in space and there's nothing underneath them. And you can't justify them. You've just got to like start with them and then go from there. So for Descartes, there was, I think, therefore I am. Anyway, and in conclusion, for me at least, a lot of these thought experiments go, well, if I can't even know that I'm real, that just gives me this huge humility. Um, and so I think my takeaway would be something like, whoop, stay humble, stay humble. Um, because if, you know, if you can't even know whether you exist or whether this is a simulated experience or not, you've got to be super humble about all these other things you're really strongly opinionated about. Uh, make sure you're always testing your assumptions and realize that whatever you believe underneath it, there's just a few fundamental beliefs hanging in space. And that's the situation we're all in. Um, so sorry, I couldn't get to more of these things in the chat. You guys have got, oh my gosh, there's so much beautiful stuff here. Um, I haven't learned my lesson about trying to put too much in. Um, uh, but, but yes, go Fatima, new ruler. Um, I, I want you to rule in life, in love, uh, go in peace. Thank you so much for being part of this Aim High Live. Um, if you want to look up some of the stuff we, we talked about today, it's Nick Bostrom's simulation theory argument. You can look it up online. He's got some like accessible documents on it. Um, we talked about Rene Descartes. I'd encourage you to look into his stuff. We look at Kendrick Lamar, Stay Humble. I'd encourage you to listen to his album, Damn. I'd also encourage you to, uh, if you aren't already, follow us on uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitch, YouTube. Basically, wherever you're already watching this, follow us there, but also follow us on the other ones I just mentioned, Aim High Live. Also, if Ms. Only One uh, or Aim High Live, Matthew Shribman want to do this. I haven't got this ready, but there's a, a survey we're doing with a bunch of Aim High Livers about like your experience, what makes you want to like take part in this thing, what are you getting out of it? We'd love to hear from you. Uh, and so we're going to post a little form link uh, in the chat. So please click through on that and uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, but for now, I've been Nish. You've been great. Some great chat chat today so i can get to all of it um this has been do we live in a simulation uh and also another another takeaway watch any of these that you haven't watched if not all of them big love to you all have a great lockdown going back through the vortex farewell